Damn Reincarnation Chapter 401 Sacred Statue 1. The festival had drawn to a close, and guests from foreign lands had taken their leave, the members of the Lionheart family. 2. Journeyed back to Kiel and the Black Lion Castle, though they had come to Shimuin for Eugene without hesitation, the Black Lion Castle, which was the border stronghold, couldn't be left unattended for long, yet not all had departed. When do you suppose we'll do it? Came a voice. While the King of Arath, the court wizards, and the tower masters had left, Melkith remained in Shimuin. From early dawn, she sought out Eugene, and even now, she trailed behind him while nagging incessantly. What are you talking about? Uh, Eugene asked, feigning ignorance. Her eyebrows twitched in irritation, but instead of showing anger, she rubbed her hands together while flashing a pitiful smile. Well, Eugene, we had such a good time yesterday, didn't we? I thought so, but did you not? Melka said. Don't say something like that. Someone's going to misunderstand if they overhear your words. Responded Eugene. Last night, at the banquet, was the promise we made just drunken words? Was it just a mere fleeting game for you? Melketh forced tears into her eyes as she clung to Eugene. She pushed herself against him, clearly to draw the attention of onlookers, but to no avail. Still, her desperate attempts proved ineffective. Ahem, clearing her throat softly, Melka straightened up and changed her target. Big Sisiena, speak for me. For me. You also heard it yesterday. Melkith begged. What? What are you? stuttered Sienna. I'm talking about W-Y-N-N-Y-D, W-Y-N-N-Y-D. Before he danced with you, sis, he promised to lend me W-Y-N-N-Y-D. You heard him, shouted Melkith. Sienna's face turned a deep shade of red in response. She took a sharp breath before looking around quickly. They stood in the central plaza of the capital. Due to prior announcements, the crowd was controlled, and the royal knights of Shimuin surrounded the entire square to stand guard. The vast square was nearly empty, but still, Sienna feared someone might have overheard Melkatha's words. Why are you acting like that after all that? Mare murmured as if she found Sienna's reaction ridiculous. However, Sienna valued her reputation in even trivial matters. As such, this was an important, sensitive topic. She may have danced openly the day before, but come the next day, the memory of that dance left her too embarrassed to even lift her head. That's simply who Sienna Merdian was as a person. Don't remember as you please. I said I would lend it under certain conditions. When did I ever say I'd just lend it to you? retorted Eugene. You really are too much. After all I've done for you, do you really have to go nitty-gritty over the small things? Melkath asked, sounding hurt. When have I ever directly asked for your help? You always took it upon yourself, Lady Melkath. And every time I received your assistance, I believed I paid a fitting price, Eugene stated coldly. Eugene, Eugene. Such words are really unkind. A fitting price? Our relationship is not so transactional. If I want to help, I help. If you wish to lend, you lend. Isn't that better? Look at me. I, the White Tower Master, Melkath Elhaya, flew to this distant southern land just to celebrate with you and stand by your side against any possible danger. Melkath waved both arms in frustration as she grumbled. She grumbled. Yet Eugene snorted in derision and responded. Why do you put on such airs? You weren't the only one who came for me. Frankly, if we're talking about great people, isn't the Blue Tower Master, Herodus Yusland, an immensely remarkable being? Ugh. But Melkith was interrupted before she could respond. While the Blue Tower Master is not my mentor, during my studies in Arath, he provided me with insights on magic several times. He also stood by me during the hearings, continued Eugene. Uh. Melkith's response was cut short once more. He even came to Shimuin for me this time, yet the Blue Tower Master never once demanded anything from me, declared Eugene. Eugene, shouldn't you at least give something in return then? Maybe send a return gift or so? Melkath finally retorted. She felt that Eugene was simply too shameless, to the point of disbelief, and glared at him with narrowed eyes at her words. Eugene felt a pang of guilt and thought, perhaps I should send a New Year's gift. Yet, the immediate concern wasn't his relationship with the Blue Tower Master, was it? 
Eugene snuck a glance at Melketh as she approached and asked, Have you considered any terms? I've thought about it. But it's tough. You have so much, Eugene. Even if I were to give an artifact from the White Tower, it would pale in comparison to what you possess. And giving money? Even my entire fortune wouldn't meet your eyes, complained Melketh. That may be true. I'm not saying I need something right now. Even so, Eugene left room for negotiation. Melketh was an unparalleled master of spirit magic, and she would prove crucial for the upcoming battles. During the war against the demon king of incarceration, Melketh, who had contracts with three spirit kings, would arguably be the most powerful among the wizards, excluding Sienna. But if Melketh successfully forged a contract with Tempest, then Melketh alone could potentially turn the battleground into ruins and slaughter the demons. Well, yes, probably. Tempest couldn't deny that. He disliked Melketh. He found Melketh's lack of dignity unbefitting a master of spirit magic. In addition, the human Melketh Elhea was, too, peculiar. However, setting that aside, no one could deny Melketh's genius. Thus, Tempest made his own resolution. The storm was bound by regrets from three hundred years ago. Tempest still longed for a victory he couldn't grasp in a war long past. When Eugene ascended the demon king's castle, Tempest intended to assist Eugene as before, and that was enough. But if there was another way to contribute more to the war, admittedly, that was a very tempting thought. You don't need artifacts, nor money. Then there's only one thing I can offer, said Melketh after contemplation. Slowly raising both hands, Melketh pointed a finger gun at Eugene and mock fired. I offer myself, she declared with a wink. Eugene's face twisted in shock, and Sienna's eyes went cold. A chilling sound of bones cracking emanated from beneath Christina's concealed robe. Melketh hadn't expected such a reaction, and she awkwardly lowered her hand. Air my body and heart. She stuttered. Do you want a beating? Questioned Eugene. Really, that's too much. How can you say that to your sister? Ah, uh, okay, I get it. Just listen, don't leave. Melka said as she hastily drew forth a quill from within her robes and traced letters in there. As she did, the space where she inscribed the characters folded upon itself and transformed into a sheet of white parchment. Handing the crisp paper to Eugene, Melka said, Know what this is. What is it? asked Eugene. Behold, a Melketh coupon. If you use this, use this, well, I'm not going to honor requests to die in your stead, kill myself, or what not, but I'll oblige most other requests, said Melketh. Was this some sort of magical contract? Eugene mused as he examined the silvered Melketh coupon. Surely this isn't a one-time deal, right? What, huh? Melketh was thoroughly confused. It seems rather unfair. If you were to form a pact with Tempest, the accord would last for decades. Yet you'd heed my request just once for brokering it? Questioned Eugene. Ah, uh, is that how it is? Melketh faltered. Let's negotiate then, Eugene declared. From his days as a mercenary three hundred years ago, Eugene had learned one essential truth. Whether it be a promise or a pact, persistence was key. In simpler terms, he who spoke loudest and most assuredly often prevailed. Let's set the deadline till all the demon kings have perished from this world, said Eugene. You mean, I have to honor your request till then? Asked Melketh. Think, think Lady Melketh. Honestly, what is this Melketh coupon? Even without it, would you refuse my requests? You'd listen, wouldn't you? Or would you not listen to my requests? said Eugene. No, I, I might ponder upon some depending on what you're asking for, but wouldn't I likely listen? Responded Melketh, precisely. Tell me, Lady Melketh, when have I ever burdened you with personal requests? I've sought you only for grave matters, for the world, and for justice. When the situation truly, truly needed your intervention, continued Eugene. That's true, Melketh admitted. It will be the same in the future. That's why I'm proposing the term to be until all the demon kings are no more. No more. With peace reigning supreme, there'd be little need for your aid. Concluded Eugene. But even after the world is at peace, you might need me for other things, right? Hey, this Lady Melketh is adept in more than just combat. 
Melka said sneakily. Should we extend the term of the contract then? How about until you die? said Eugene. And no, right, let's settle on the fall of all the demon kings. Agreed Melketh, contemplating when she might meet her demise seemed vague, setting the term until all the demon king's defeats seemed more tangible, and Melketh had already begun to incline towards that sentiment. It's settled then, Eugene declared. Yup. Melketh confirmed as she grinned broadly in agreement. Without delay, Eugene pulled WYNNYD out from his cloak and handed it to Melketh. Kaya! Melchus screamed in ecstasy while gripping W-Y-N-N-Y-D. It was clear that Tempest's determination was already wavering by the way the blade was trembling in her hands. Can I depart now? Hmm? Melchus asked in anticipation. Yes, off you go, responded Eugene. He inspected the Melchus coupon. Embedded within this coupon was a spirit. It would enable him to communicate with Melchus from anywhere that was tethered to the spirit realm. Kyo! Melketh let out a funny scream while swinging W-Y-N-M-Y-D as she soared into the sky. Judging by the height she was soaring to, it appeared as though she might be trying to commune with Tempest from a high place, just as it was done in Arath in the past. We don't have anything to ask of her right now, do we? Christina confirmed while stealing a glance towards the sky where Melketh had disappeared into. However, Eugene shook his head with a mischievous smile. No? Oh, she may be a bit odd. But, um, she seems kind-hearted. Perhaps we should refrain from making strange requests? Said Sienna with a slightly worried expression. As the founder of Circle Magic Formula, she held considerable affection for the talented Junior Melketh. As fellow wizards, she also recognized her enormous talent and, therefore, wanted to protect her. Strange requests? What are you thinking? Questioned Eugene. Like making her run through the streets naked or something responded Sienna. Why the hell would I ever ask that? questioned Eugene. Then, what are you planning? asked Sienna. It wasn't a spur-of-the-moment idea. Eugene had long contemplated acquiring the right to ask Melketh for a favor even before she offered a coupon since he concluded there was nothing else he could gain from Melketh. I intend to ask her to scour the desert on my behalf, stated Eugene. Amelia Merwin, she's hiding in Revesta now, isn't she? Christina said while narrowing her eyes, Eugene had already explained the dream he had witnessed yesterday through Noir, Sienna, Christina, and Anise knew its contents. The demon king of destruction slumbered in the territory of Revesta. That's where Amelia Merwin was hiding. Meanwhile, Vermouth was sealed in what could be considered the demon king's temple, bound to a chair by chains. The dungeons of the Nahama Desert have the second largest number of black wizards after Helmuth. With Sienna's return, the Black Tower of Arath had collapsed on its own. Black wizards had mostly vanished from Arath, likely guessing that the wise Sienna, who had opposed the tower's establishment long ago, still did not favor them. Most had either returned to Helmuth or sought refuge in the dungeons beneath the Nahama Desert. Amelia Merwin can't hide in Revesta forever. At some point, she'll have to leave, but we don't have to just wait for that. Amelia Merwin held no official position in the desert kingdom of Nahama. However, it was an unspoken truth that she was the sultan's closest confidant. Even if she held no official title, she had even participated as the sultan's advisor during the night march. Furthermore, she was the dungeon master of the desert. While she might not have direct disciples, realistically, countless black wizards would be serving under her. Eugene had obtained information on the dungeon's black wizards from Kiel's spies. Kiel bordered Nahama and was at odds with Nahama's aggressive territorial expansion. Were it not for Helmuth, a war would have erupted between Kiel and Nahama long ago. It'd be easier to ask Lady Melketh rather than searching that vast desert. Alone. She's contracted with the Earth Spirit King, so she would be far better at scouring the desert than me, stated Eugene. In Amelia's absence, the black wizards could be hunted down one by one. They would be pushed out of their hiding holes. That would weaken Amelia's power, and perhaps she might even run out from Revesta in her rage. Moreover, it would also serve to taunt Nahama, who was very clearly wary of offending Helmuth. If you had come to Shimuin with your tail lowered, I might have spared you. Eugene thought Nahama was a wretched nation, second only to Helmuth in its number of black wizards, even three centuries ago. Eugene held no fondness for Nahama. 
During his days as a mercenary, he was often thwarted by desert. Born assassins, and the public secret had been that Nahama allied with black wizards and demons. Are you planning to wage war against Nahama? Christina asked, concern evident on her face. The Tower Master of Arath must remain neutral. If we're not careful, a war might erupt between Arath and Nahama. That would make the position of all the Tower Masters precarious. Sienna murmured to this, Eugene proudly pointed to the emblem on his left chest. It was a thing he obtained just yesterday. The emblem, a lion's crest, shone brightly. So what? Sienna questioned. It was a promise to heed Eugene's request, bypassing all protocols, even invoking the royal authority if needed. Indeed, in Arath, the Tower Masters must stand neutral. If Melketh, a Tower Master, were to provoke Nahama, leading to an outbreak of war, Arath would likely hold Melketh accountable rather than engage in the battle. But what if Eugene were to invoke the emblem's power? What if he were to say that Nahama's embrace of black wizards weighs in affront? What if he suggested they go to war? You cheeky brat. Sienna muttered under her breath once she realized Eugene's thoughts. Eugene just responded with a snort, of course. A war might not necessarily ensue. If it did, wouldn't it be akin to Nahama openly admitting their subservience to Helmuth? On the surface, Nahama seemingly had no connection with Helmuth. At most, the sultan's advisor was a black wizard contracted with the demon king of incarceration, merely the current staff of incarceration, moreover. They would reason that black wizards simply loved the desert, which was why so many resided in Nahama. Bullshit. Eugene cursed to himself. The demon king of incarceration would not directly wage war for the sultan, but observing the audacity of that wretch, it seemed he might not prevent Helmuth's demons from aiding Nahama, even if were not to participate in a war directly. If Nahama could not withstand the blows from all sides and declared war, the demons contracted with the black wizard Saf Nahama could well join the war, and that outcome, ironically, was what Eugene hoped for. Now then, Eugene adjusted his expression and focused on the task ahead, now that he had what he needed from Melketh. It was time that he tended to the matter in the square. Should I strike a pose? He pondered aloud. A statue titled Hero Eugene Lionheart was to be erected in. This very square, with a sigh, he cast a forlorn gaze at the waiting dwarf artisans in the distance.